I am the new board president as of January 1st. Uh, so diving right into 2021, along with uh, uh, very my esteemed board, other board members who are on here. So thank you all. Raise your hands if you're on the board. Say hi to everybody. Uh, and we've got a, before we dive into the, the program tonight, uh, one of the things that we always do is unusual bird sightings. So has anyone had any unusual bird sightings over the past month? There is uh, up by Schuyler, which is one of Wachuskas counties, up by, by Schuyler on Highway 30 uh, is a snowy owl that's been up there for a couple of weeks now. Mm -hmm. uh, has anyone been up, been up there? Have you been up there, March, to see it? We're talking about it, but we haven't got there yet. Yeah. It would be nice. Like there's a few vehicles every day that are stopping by, and mm -hmm. some people are getting some great pictures. Yeah. We, we went to. We careful. enjoyed it. We went to Mound City to see the eagles and all the waterfowl. Oh, oh did you go down to Les Bluffs? Cool. Did you make it there, Lana, while the 600 were still hanging around? No, we went the weekend after, but there were still quite a few of them. Wow. Yeah. And a lot of swans and, you know, all kinds of waterfowl and stuff. So, mm -hmm. and they're still there, I think. Yeah, I, th I think there are still several there. Yeah. Um, and the, the Christmas bird count was uh, last week, a couple weeks ago. Anybody have any fun things on that during that? We had 13 wild turkeys at the landfill right at the end of the, the time when they were open when they count. So that was a surprise. Cool. Yeah, that's cool, Bruce. Okay. I had the two uh, brown-headed cowbirds riding on top of the buffalo out at Pioneer Park. <laughs> I had a tufted titmouse. Did you? Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But not for, too. He didn't show up for the Christmas count. He showed up two days later. I was very <laughs> mad at him. <laughs> we saw a, uh, a, a kestrel. Uh, on West O during the Christmas bird count. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Looking for some food. Cool. Yeah. So there in another month or so we'll really start seeing a lot of lot of things coming back, coming through. Um, okay. Uh, so announcements. The only announcement that I have is uh, that the board meeting is next Tuesday. Uh, January 19th, 7 p.m. via Zoom. Uh, as always, the board meetings are, are open to anyone who, who would like to sit in and, and uh, listen, in this case, listen, watch and listen on those. So if you uh, are not a board member and are interested, just shoot me an email. Uh, and I'll put my email address in the, in the chat room uh, for folks to see. Uh, any board members, any other messages that any other board members might have? Okay. Uh, Arliss, anything you have? I don't think so. Okay. All right. And then just in general, anyone else who's, who's on the, uh, at the meeting tonight, anything you'd like to mention? Okay. If not, then we will dive right into our evening program. Um, and the, our, let's see, we have two presenters tonight. Uh, first, I think Dave, you're going first. Okay. All right. Dave Sands has been the executive director of the Nebraska Land Trust since 2003. The mission of the trust is to foster the protection of agricultural, historical, and natural resources on land in Nebraska through education, partnering, and permanent conservation. In his role, Dave is on the front lines, working with private landowners to help them carry out their visions for protecting lands in a changing world. He'll talk to us about Pine Ridge, one such example, which has been funded by the Nebraska Environmental Trust. Lori Benson, a retired lawyer, uh, most recently has been instrumental in forming 
the new not-for-profit group called the Friends of the Environmental Trust. And Lori's going to talk to us a little bit about, about that, about the new, the new group there. Her, uh, during her career, she's helped environmental organizations like the Groundwater Foundation and the Water Center in the School of Natural Resources at UNL. Uh, so welcome to both of you. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Do you want Dave questions after you talk and before Lori, or would you rather prefer to both of you and then we do general questions? I think I prefer we both give our presentations and then use whatever time is left for questions. Okay, That's perfect. Okay. Perfect. And remember, you can also put your questions in the chat box and uh, uh, Arliss will be monitoring that and then she can uh, ask questions from that too and as we get done. But we should have plenty of time for some Q&A at the end. So with that, Dave, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you all so much for having me tonight. It's great to see many of your faces, albeit virtually. So appreciate you inviting me, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, tonight's presentation we titled The Good, The Bad, and The Solution uh, relating to the Environmental Trust. And I have to start by saying the Environmental Trust has done so much good over the years for us and other organizations, it would be impossible to capture it all in one presentation. Uh, and so what I'm gonna focus on is just one grant uh, to show you the power of one environmental trust grant for protecting one of the most cherished landscapes in Nebraska. And that cherished landscape I'm gonna talk about is Nebraska's Pine Ridge. You know, I first went out to the Pine Ridge when I was maybe nine years old. My dad took me out there and my brothers. And I have to tell you, that probably is what kindled my love of natural Nebraska. I was an Eastern Nebraska kid, grew up uh, looking at cornfields. I had no idea that Nebraska had its own piece of the Mountain West. And that is exactly what the Pine Ridge is but from a wildlife perspective, from a landscape perspective, from an economic perspective, it is a part of the West. And so with that, I'm gonna start, if I can get my screen shared here. Okay, has everyone uh, seen my slide? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Great. yes. So what I'm gonna talk about tonight is the Pines and Buttes Preservation Project, which was a community conservation uh, initiative that the Nebraska Land Trust uh, started in the Pine Ridge in about 2014. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the Nebraska Land Trust, we are a conservation easement land trust and we're an agricultural land trust. And what I mean by that, is that we don't own any land, uh, but we have protected around 32,000 acres uh, all across the state uh, through conservation easements with willing private landowners. And in a state where 97% of the land is privately owned, it just makes sense to have a strategy to work with landowners. And because most of those landowners are agricultural, we design our easements in a very specific way so that they are compatible with the normal workings of a farm and ranch. The idea is that, sure, on the one end of the spectrum, you could design a conservation easement to protect a specific species of wildlife on a ranch. But if you did that, it might end well for the wildlife, but it probably wouldn't end well for the rancher. On the other end of the spectrum, you could design the easement to protect the working ranch, protect it from fragmentation and subdivision, and figure if there's a lot of wildlife on that ranch after 100 years of ranch management, the best thing we can do is preserve that ranch and its managers. And so that's what the Nebraska Land Trust is about. Now, for those of you who don't know the Pine Ridge, I hope most of you have had a chance to be there, but it is in the very Northwest corner of Nebraska. And it is a biologically unique landscape sandwiched between the Oglala Grasslands BUL and the Panhandle Prairies BUL. And the reason it's so biologically important is it's really a mosaic. You know, we call it a Pine Ridge and yes, there are great escarpments, uh, towering buttes, ponderosa pine, but there's also uh, sweeping native grasslands. We have our own badlands out there that in my view are every bit as beautiful as the South Dakota badlands, albeit not as large. And then you have the ponderosa pine forest and riparian woodlands. So it truly is a mosaic of habitats. And because of that, uh, it is very biologically diverse. You know, just a few numbers. It is 2,700 square miles in size. It's about 100 miles long. It dips down into Nebraska in an arc, starting in the very northwest corner, dipping down to Shadron, and then curving back up into South Dakota in Sheridan County. 
Uh, the altitude ranges from 3,000 to 5,200 feet. And that's important because as we look at climate change, we're looking for corridors where wildlife can move up or down uh, depending upon the climate. And this is an area, a contiguous area where wildlife could move considerably uphill if they needed to. And just to give you an idea of biological diversity, I chose a quote from Paul Johnsgaard's book, The Nature of Nebraska, where Sioux County alone supports 128 breeding species of birds. And that's second, or, and it's only exceeded by the very southeast corner of the state, which would be the area around Rulo in the Missouri Valley, the upper Missouri Valley in Northeast Nebraska and the lower Niobrara Valley in Northeast Nebraska. So exceptionally important area for birds as well as other wildlife. Uh, and one of the other wildlife that exist in the Pine Ridge are bighorn sheep. They were extirpated from the Pine Ridge uh, through hunting in the early part of the 1900s, but then they were reintroduced by Gaiman Parks, I believe in the 1990s. And so maintaining habitat for this bighorn herd is important so it doesn't get subdivided and fragmented through uh, ranchettes. And so our initial foray into the Pine Ridge where we happened to come across two very high quality easements that were critical uh, for bighorns and to protect those properties through conservation easements, we applied for a, a $769,000 grant from the Environmental Trust with the intent of matching it with federal funds from the NRCS. And this is one of those properties. This is the Chief Dullknife College property. Those buttes you see in the background are called the Cheyenne buttes, and they provide critical lambing habitat for bighorn sheep. And it only takes one look at the map to understand how critical this property was for conservation. Can you imagine if that property had been subdivided and covered with homes in full view of the state park uh, and, and the highway and so forth? And so it was a very important easement. Uh, to obtain. The second easement that we had uh, in that grant was the Fisher Ranch. And yes, that is my picture of a bighorn sheep. Uh, and it was literally the first time I went out on the property with Gary Fisher and his, his off-road vehicle. And we weren't out five minutes uh, and we saw that bighorn on the ridge. I accuse Gary of sticking a statue up there to impress me, but <laughs> it was a, indeed a bighorn sheep. And again, a look at the map shows you how critical this property is. The red area is the Fisher Ranch. And as you can see, it provided a migration bridge between thousands of acres of protected land in the Ponderosa <clears throat> Wildlife Management Area and thousands of acres of protected land in the Nebraska National Forest. And bighorns and elk and other wildlife migrate back and forth between those two large areas of protected land. And if the fishers had decided to put ranch ets on that 500 and some acres instead of conserving it, it would have been like throwing a barricade across that migration bridge. And as it turned out, those two easements actually appraised at less than we had estimated. So we had some funding left to tackle a third project. And that third project was 1,304 acres that were conserved in the Pine Ridge of Sioux County in South Valley Canyon. And this is where that property is located. And although it wasn't contiguous to other uh, public land. It is contiguous to Coffee Park, which is a local park in South Belly Canyon. And I don't know if many of you are old enough to remember Fred Thomas, who used to write for the Omaha World Herald. And I remember Fred once did an informal poll of well-traveled Nebraskans, and he, he said that South Belly Canyon was voted as the most beautiful place in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And that leads us to the Pines and Buttes Preservation Project. Uh, in 2012, after we completed the Fisher and Dolnife uh, easements, we had a board meeting out in the Pine Ridge. Some of our board members had been there, some hadn't, but all were marveling at the scenery and wondering if we should make that part of the state our second conservation focus area. The Nebraska Land Trust was actually formed to conserve land between the two largest cities in the Lower Platte Valley. Uh, and that was been our conservation focus area from the start. And so it was a very large leap for us uh, to make a 50, 450 mile jump to Northwest Nebraska, but that is exactly what we decided to do. And like any initiative, you really start with education and outreach. We held a, a informational meeting at the NRD about agricultural land easements. Uh, and despite the foot of snow that fell that night before, we had very good attendance. And one of those attendees ended up in uh, doing a conservation easement with us. Another thing we did, <clears throat> excuse me, was we started having 
quiet conversations with community leaders uh, to see, you know, if they thought there was a need for conservation easements in the Nebraska Land Trust or the Pine Ridge. And we felt it was very important to kind of <clears throat> talk to these folks because at the end of the day, all conservation is local, just like politics. I've always said if conservation and especially land conservation isn't supported by the people that live on the land, uh, you're not gonna be successful and success isn't gonna be sustainable. And this is a picture of Gary and Nancy Fisher on their land who did the very first conservation easement with us in the Pine Ridge. And Nancy Fisher is currently the chairman of our advisory committee up there. So as we talked to local folks, we kept getting a story that very much uh, resembles this paraphrased quote. When the Pine Ridge ranches are sold these days, they aren't being sold to local ranchers anymore. They're being sold to people from California, Colorado, and Florida. And I, I expressed surprise at Florida, especially, and they even have a name for all the Floridians all up there. They call them juicers because uh, some of these people have sold orange groves in South Florida and then transitioned that money into recreational ranches in the Pine Ridge. And so I use this anecdotal quote for years, uh, but the quote was actually borne out uh, statistically in 2017. Every year, uh, the University of Nebraska does a farm real estate market survey. And that survey in 2017 found that 45% of land buyers in Northwest Nebraska were not agricultural. And that's a problem because when land is in agriculture, it's your livelihood and you're probably not gonna risk that livelihood. Uh, but when you're, it's not in agriculture, uh, then the land is no longer a livelihood, it's an asset. And at some point, this generation or their grandkids might decide they wanna maximize that asset through subdivision and development into ranchettes. Uh, another troubling statistic was that 36% of land purchases in the Pine Ridge that year were out of state buyers. And just to put that into perspective, the runner up in that statistic was Northern Nebraska where 4% of the buyers were from out of state. So these are two giant red flags that land use and land ownership were changing in the Pine Ridge and that concerned the local ranchers and that's why we ultimately were welcomed into the landscape. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention there are other more exotic threats to the Pine Ridge as well, uh, such as the Crow Butte uranium mine and all of that mine is winding down. My understanding is they're still prospecting for new sites in the Pine Ridge. So these conversations that yes, there's a place for the Nebraska Land Trust and conservation easements led to the formation of a Pine Ridge Advisory Committee in 2014. And we formed the advisory committee because you know we were gonna be spending public dollars on land conservation and you always wanna get the biggest conservation bang for the buck. But we didn't wanna define what that conservation bang was from 450 miles away. We wanted local people to tell us what was important to them. Uh, this is just a list of the of various people that served on it and continue to serve on it. It's an ongoing standing committee of the Nebraska Land Trust. And I think the most important members were that we did have ranchers from all three counties along the ridge, uh, Sioux, Dawes, and Sheridan. We asked these people basically three questions. What makes your region unique? What would you conserve for future generations? And what are your priorities? We put a bunch, all this stuff up on a whiteboard and we had them rank them in order of priorities. And then we assigned points. And that led to a scoring protocol that was uh, approved by the committee and then approved by the NLT board that we would then use to physically go out and score properties. So we literally selected the best of the best. And over the last six years, we have scored 17 properties covering 20,000 acres. And they all go on a spreadsheet that looks like this. And this is how we identify the best of the best potential projects. Now, the bigger uh, problem of land conservation in the Pine Ridge was funding because it's expensive. Even conservation easements, when you're not buying the land in fee, it's still expensive to buy the development rights. I've got to tell you, you know, we're working with farmers, you know, working farmers and ranchers, uh, mostly ranchers actually. And people in agriculture cannot afford to donate conservation easements or a very large part of a conservation easement because the land is their biggest asset and they just can't afford to donate a significant portion of their largest asset. So they need to be compensated. And so you get conservation easements appraised and then you pay them for that appraised value. We knew that the Natural Resources Conservation Service was the first place we would go because they have a federal program it's been well-funded for many years. It receives bipartisan support uh, whenever the farm bill is up for reauthorization in Congress. 
And the amount of money put into this program continues to go up because of its popularity. And this program will fund 50% of a conservation easement's appraised value on a working farm or ranch, or if it's a very high quality native grassland that's used, utilized for grazing, they'll fund 75%. And that part of the program is called the Grassland of Special Significance or GSS. And the Nebraska Land Trust has received roughly $10 million from this program since 2008 for projects from Sarpy to Sioux County. And the other partner, likely partner, that we thought we could rely on was the Nebraska Environmental Trust. We had gotten a million dollar block grant from the Environmental Trust for the Lower Platte Valley uh, earlier in the decade. Uh, we did very well with the grant over delivered both in terms of match and protected acres. And so we thought we'd try the same thing in the Pine Ridge line. This was a little bit different. We uh, promised a one-to-one -one match in dollars. We promised local involvement in project selection through uh, formation of the advisory committee. <clears throat> and we said we would uh, strive to protect 5,200 acres of land through four projects with that grant. As it turned out in 2015, the Environmental Trust created $900,000, so $100,000 less than we'd asked for. And at the, the end result of the grant, uh, we provided a two to one match. So twice what we said, $1.8 million. Uh, we did provide that local involvement uh, and, and which also generated local support, support for our projects. Conservation easements have to be approved by counties. It was important that the counties understood what we were doing. And because neighbors talked to neighbors up there and there were relatives of county commissioners on our advisory committee, uh, our approvals of conservation easements sailed through the county commissions in the Pine Ridge. And finally, and most important, uh, we protected double what we said we were. We ended up protecting 10,137 acres of protection through five projects instead of four. Now, there were other funding partners for the conservation easement purchases. Uh, all five landowners contributed. Some of them contributed the significant stewardship endowments that are required for us to take care of these lands in perpetuity. Uh, yeah, some of them did donate a portion of their conservation easement. Uh, also, the Conservation Fund and Margaret Cargill Foundation provided a quarter million dollars. The Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation has been an exceptional partner with providing $150,000. The Nebraska Big Game Society provided $30,000 and the Nebraska Chapter of Trout Unlimited provided $5,000. And I would be remiss in talking about funding if I didn't mention that this also represents rural economic development. When ranchers get these payments, uh, when ranchers get, I'm sorry, when ranchers get these payments, they aren't sticking them in offshore accounts. They're paying down debt, they're buying more land, they're expanding their herds, they're fixing fence, they're buying equipment, uh, building buildings. These funds revolve in the community and create an economic stimulus in these local communities where they're spent. And I used to tell these anecdotal stories about what the ranchers were doing with these funds, but that, those anecdotal stories were backed up with research in 2020 because uh, Colorado State University uh, released a study that found that roughly $89 million in Colorado NRCS easement expenditures generated $190 some million in new economic activity. So if this ratio is applied to the 2.7 million spent in the Pine Ridge for conservation easements, it generated around $6 million in economic, new economic activity. But of course, you know, conservation isn't about dollars and acres, it's about the land. It's about the resources that get protected. And so I'm gonna run you through the five uh, spectacular properties that get, did get protected with these dollars. Uh, the uh, first one we protected was the Anderson Ranch. It's 547 acres on the north side of the Pine Ridge. And the grassland was of such quality that it did qualify for the NRCS grassland of special significance and received a 75% cost share. It also had a riparian woodlands along Cottonwood Creek, which is what you're looking at. And that is a magnet for uh, wildlife in that area because the north side of the Pine Ridge is very, very dry. And this is where that property is located in relation to Crawford. Uh, the second property we conserved was the MJD Ranch, uh, 2,443 2, acres in Dawes County, actually 100 acres in Sheridan County as well. And this property was extremely unique because of the number of elk that use it year round. Todd Nordine, who's the big game manager with uh, Game and Parks, 
uh, told me this might be one of the most important elk properties, if not the most important elk property in the Pine Ridge because elk use it as a mating ground in the fall, uh, winter cover, they find winter cover and feed uh, and they use it in the spring. The elk are literally there all year round. And it, I gotta tell you, I've seen elk throughout the mountain west, including Rocky Mountain National Park. I have never had a more phenomenal elk experience in viewing elk than I had on this ranch. And this is where it's located. And you can see it's fairly close to Shadron. And as you drive out there from Shadron, you see ranchettes, little acreages are popping up all along the road, all the way out there. And so it was important to get this ranch under protection before it uh, also was developed into acreages. The third uh, project uh, completed is one that's very near and dear to my heart because Toadstool Park was the place that really dropped my jaw when I was nine years old, I gotta tell you. Uh, and it has since been a place that I've returned many times with my own children. It is literally not only one of my favorite places in the state, it's one of my favorite places in the country and what I've seen of the world. It is a very special place. And we had an opportunity to protect a 3,600 acre ranch that was adjacent to Toadstool Park. And this map shows you how important that is. The area outlined in orange is Toadstool Park. The area that's shaded in yellow is the, our Heritage Guest Ranch. And that little donut hole in the middle, yeah, that is indeed a donut hole of federal land right in the middle of the ranch. And out in this part of the Pine Ridge, there's an odd development threat because private ranchers or ranches are being subdivided into small parcels for fossil hunters because you can't dig fossils in Toadstool Park or anywhere in federal land. And so anytime a fossil hunter can get their hands on their own private parcel to go dig, they're gonna buy it. And a large ranch out there did subdivide into small parcels for fossils. Uh, this ranch is uh, very rich in fossils and Gene will allow you to pick them up if they're on the surface, but the conservation easement forbid excavation of fossils unless there's a very significant excavation done by the University of Nebraska or something like that. And, you know, as Gene told me, you know, in this part of the Pine Ridge, 3,600 acres is the minimum needed for an economically viable ranch. And so she said, you know, this has been in her family since the 1880s, and she did not want to see this ranch subdivided into anything smaller than it already was. The fourth project we took on was the Wohler's Ranch, 633 acres in Dawes County. And remember that picture of the big red barn I showed under rural development? That's on this ranch and that barn is on the National Register of Historic Places because it was built over a hundred years ago without blueprints from locally sawn lumber. And it's still standing as square and firm as it, it was the day it was built. Uh, but from an ecological standpoint, Wohler's Ranch is at the very top of West Ash Creek, uh, Creek Canyon. And in 2012, a wildfire tore through that canyon and, and burnt most of the pine forest uh, in the canyon. Except when it got to Wooler's Ranch, they had done such a phenomenal job of limbing and thinning and trimming their pine trees that when it hit their ranch, the fire dropped to the ground, burned across their ranch as a grass fire, and then went back into the crown after it got off their ranch. So now these, this remaining grove of pines at the very top of West Ash Creek is a seed island that could poten potentially help to re reseed the rest of the watershed over time. And this gives you an idea of where it's located. And finally, the fifth project, we had about $55,000 left in our block grant uh, to tackle this final project. And it was a, it was a very large project. It was a, it was a million dollar easement. Uh, and because it was so large, 2,892 acres, uh, it, had, it was a very rare conservation easement in that it provides public access to four miles of the White River through Game and Park's Open Fields and Waters program. And, that, and that's important because the White River in this stretch is a premier trout stream in Nebraska and anyone can walk in there and fish. Also, from an ecological standpoint, there were 20 documented at-risk species either on the ranch or within a three-mile radius, and it was adjacent to the Peterson Wildlife Management Area. So this map gives you an idea how important it was. Uh, the area in purple was an addition to the Peterson that I believe was partly funded by the Environmental Trust. Uh, and this ranch adjoined the addition. What looks like a hole in the ranch is actually a school section. And so the ranch management is tied together because the Cramans leased that school section. And another thing I want to point out, you see the Dolnite easement there shaded in blue. 
Uh, this area of protected public land is around 22,000 acres. So it's 22,000 acres of contiguous protected habitat. These two easements alone increase that contiguous protected habitat by about 12%. So now I've covered the good, I'm afraid I have to turn to the bad. And it starts when we thought that be, based on the success of our, in the Pine Ridge, that we would try and replicate it in the Lower Platte Valley with form an advisory committee, which creates scoring criteria, and then hopefully get a block grant from the Nebraska Environmental Trust uh, to match with federal funds and other funds to purchase conservation easements between the states two largest cities, an area projected to have 2 million people by 2050. And I'm gonna, here's the timeline of the bad. So in 2016, we applied to NET for a million dollar block grant based on the Pine Ridge model of community conservation. In 2017, the grant ranked 15th out of 130 requests. It was the highest ranking grant I've ever written to the NET. Uh, the NET did grant first year funding of $350,000 and invited us to resubmit for the remainder. And because it ranked so highly, we thought we had a good chance of receiving the remainder. And sure enough, in 2018, when we did re reapply, the grants committee recommended approval of 650,000. But the grant without notice and without cause was pulled in April, tabled to August and then killed in August. And so we lost $650,000 for land protection between the state's two largest cities. And then as if to rub salt into the wound, we had been holding on to that $350,000 to hopefully protect a very important property adjacent to Shram State Park. Uh, it, it was gonna take time for the owners to kind of work through some family issues. So we needed another year. And we requested what should have been a one year extension for that 350,000, which had always been granted previously by the Environmental Trust in this kind of situation. And I was stunned when our request for a one-year extension was unanimously rejected with minimal discussion. I think the only comment that was made was they'd screwed around long enough and they took back that 350,000. Uh, now, I can tell you this has a happy ending. Uh, in June, uh, the board did pass a COVID extension for all grants and that included the 350,000. And in December, we used that 350,000 to conserve a beautiful 170 acre farm, uh, just uh, about a mile from Shram Park in the Shram Bluffs of Sarpy County with Oak Hickory Woodlands, archeological sites, spring fed stream. It is truly a spectacular property. So it did have a happy ending. So what, the only excuse that sort of made sense on the block grant on why they pulled it was they said, they don't wanna do any more block grants. They only wanted to fund individual projects. So we thought, okay, We'll use the environmental trust to fund spectacular consequential projects. And one came to us in 2018, uh, 1100 acre prairie, uh, never plowed prairie that's adjacent to Willa Cather Prairie, south of Red Cloud. And so there was an opportunity, the Willa Cather Prairie is roughly a section, a little less than 640 acres. And this was an opportunity to add 11, 1147 acres of protection, nearly tripling the area of grass that would never be plowed under. And so we thought it was an excellent candidate for the Environmental Trust. There were prairie chickens on the property. Wayne Malhoff, who wrote, wrote the Breeding Bird Atlas, had used, had placed this property on his uh, breeding bird survey and verified there were all kinds of species there, including booming grounds for prairie chickens. And we already had 50% of the money in hand. So we were asking the Environmental Trust for the other 50%. Well, in 2019, the grant did rank well, but the NET board, offered 50% of what we requested if we would do, a, if we were gonna do a perpetual easement, but 100% of what we asked for if we would do a temporary easement. So you heard that right. They offered 50% funding for permanent protection and 100% funding for temporary protection. Think about that for a minute when you think about the Environmental Trust Board and how far they veered off course. <clears throat> and again, the project did get completed because we went to NRCS and were able to make up the difference from that source. And so finally, I said, told our board, we're going to submit what I would call a litmus test grant to the NET, one that is so good that if they don't fund it, they're not going to fund any more conservation easements for a very long time. Uh, we were only, this was again the Crayman Ranch, which I've already talked about. 
At the point of application, uh, we needed $117,000 roughly to make the Cramens whole on the conservation easement. We had 87% of the funding in hand. That's huge. Uh, we had a long list of partners. Uh, there was public access for trout fishing. And one of the criticisms of conservation easements is you don't get public access, but this one had it. Uh, critical lambing habitat for bighorn sheep. According to Todd Nordeen, the buttes on this property were the only suitable lambing habitat in the entire White River drainage for bighorn sheep. The 20 documented at-risk species on the ranch are within a three mile radius. And it was, addition, it was adjacent to the NET funded addition to the Peterson Wildlife Management Area. And in 2020, as some of you may have heard, the grant was recommended for funding, but then killed unceremoniously to fund a lower ranking ethanol grant. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lori to talk about the solution. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I will start by saying uh, thank you to the, uh, to Wachiska Audubon and to Audubon Nebraska for being active in the policy arena, for paying attention to bills that are introduced, for putting out action alerts and for taking action uh, as appropriate. It does make a difference. Uh, a year ago, uh, I saw a Wachiska member friend ask if I was aware that if I'd seen the, the alert you put out about the ethanol grant, uh, and I hadn't, and it kind of lured me into learning more about Wachiska. And so although I am uh, absolutely hopeless, I'm an embarrassment on what my knowledge of birds is, I really appreciate the holistic approach that Audubon is taking to protecting habitat, climate change, those, those issues. Uh, and in fact, I was so impressed that I paid dues last year. So I, I come to you as a member um, and uh, it's, it's probably one of the better decisions actually that I made last year. So thank you for that. So uh, the Friends of the Environmental Trust, uh, Dave mentioned the uh, grant that the board chose, the uh, Environmental Trust Board, which I'm gonna just refer to as the board. The board chose to fund that last year. Um, I'm sure you followed that. I'm, I'm assuming you have really a pretty good working knowledge of the, of the trust and what it's done so far. Uh, but that was so offensive that several of us got together last summer and uh, decided it was time to have a Friends of the Environmental Trust to pressure the board to do what it is they're supposed to do. So there are a dozen of us. Um, and in addition to a shared passion for the trust, what we have in common is we are not vulnerable to retaliation for speaking up about what we see as being wrong with the trust. Uh, there are, as I said, 12 of us. In addition to myself, Chris Beitler is our chair, John Bender, Jerry Lauritsen, Randy Moody, Ben Nelson, yes, that Ben Nelson, uh, Lynn Roper, Sandy Schofield, Susan Seacrest, Bob Wickersham, Dale Williamson, Gail Yanni. Uh, five of these individuals are former trust board members. Some of them were original trust board members from day one. Um, the last person, uh, the most recent serving person, uh, I believe came off the board in 2019. That was Jerry Lauritsen, uh, who the governor declined to reappoint uh, when she declined to vote as he instructed her to. Our mission, uh, as I mentioned, is, is really, to, well, we've got, a, we've got a nice mission statement. I'll refer, to our, our, refer you to our website for that. But basically it's to encourage the board to do what they're supposed to do. So we've got three things right now that we're focusing on. The first one is uh, adherence to the statutes, the regulations and board policies. Now let that sink in an outside group formed for the purpose of encouraging a, a, a governmental entity to follow their own statutes, regulations, and policies. Uh, second, uh, we are arguing for faithfulness to the mission of the trust and promises made to Nebraskans when the trust was created. I'm sure many of you like me were around at the time. We remember the promises that this was gonna fund conservation efforts, the kind of thing that they just described that it's hard to find funding for, uh, for some of the unique and beautiful and environmentally valuable places in Nebraska. Our third uh, thing that we're working on is a return to funding permanent conservation easements and land acquisitions. We are not a member organization. We do not have, we don't have anybody at all, not a one single dime, uh, but, uh, what we've decided to do, and actually I think this is a better approach, 
is to connect with other groups across the state, particularly the conservation groups, many of which um, are member organizations and have uh, ready ways to contact members through things like action alerts or newsletters and so forth. Um, and so that's how we are connecting and, and encouraging other people to be engaged and follow what the trust is doing. So what have we done so far and what has been our impact? Um, I think we all know when you work in the policy arena, you don't always know if you're having an impact or sometimes it doesn't show up for a while or sometimes maybe you're just a, a little bit of extra thumb on the scale that 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 tips it. Um, so I don't know, we, we think we've maybe had some impact and we certainly hope to going forward, but uh, time will tell on that, I guess. Uh, when we formed in July, we decided that we would always have a presence at uh, board meetings, including grant committee meetings. Um, it And it makes, I, we believe it makes a difference. It makes a difference when you've got people sitting there listening to conversations and, you know, paying attention to how people are voting. We have put out, uh, I meant to count, I don't know, uh, uh, five or six press releases. We've had three or four of them picked up, mainly by the Omaha World Herald, Paul Hamill um, is, is the reporter who follows the trust. Um, it, it's a sad state of affairs in Nebraska that we have really seen the ranks of uh, working reporters slashed in recent years. So things just don't get the coverage. It'd be nice to see, but that's the reality, um, not only in Nebraska, but nationally on, on, uh, on the press. Um, so we, we're, we're grateful we've gotten the coverage we have. Uh, I assume many of you are aware that the Environmental Trust is required every five years to have a listening session or listening sessions in every part of the state to see what the public would like to see as funding priorities for the coming five years for the trust. Uh, last year was the year to do that with uh, uh, the pandemic. They ended up doing that in three Zoom sessions rather than in three or more sessions around the state. Uh, so what we did uh, was encourage, uh, reached out to everybody we could and said, you know, please sign up for one of these Zoom meetings. We divided up our group. So we had people signed up for each of the three sessions. Um, it's because of the way they were structured, it wasn't possible to tell exactly how many people were there or, you know, what all the comments were and so forth. Uh, there is a final report from the facilitator that went to the trust board about the time of their November board meeting. We expect that it will be on the February meeting agenda of the board. Uh, so we'll be very interested in any discussion on that. And then we will be asking for the release of that full report, hopefully unredacted. Uh, and that will give us a better idea of what the public had to say. A uh, couple of things that we're fairly confident in based on what we heard ourselves and, um, and comparing notes with others, uh, three things. Uh, first is a support for conservation easements and land acquisitions, uh, as Dave just described. Second is uh, support for the, the kind of traditional projects that the trust has funded. And uh, third, interestingly, uh, and many suggestions many recommendations that they do something funding related on climate change. Uh, I'm not optimistic on that with this board, but uh, who knows, it's good that people are speaking up. I'll also mention it was discouraging in August when the board discussed this at their meeting that the responses from the board members are, why do we have to do this and do I have to go? Uh, so that is not encouraging, but we'll see what comes out of the report. Uh, another thing we've attempted to do is open conversation with the board about um, ways they can improve their grant process and so forth. Uh, right now, I, I imagine you're all aware that there is a lawsuit pending against the trust board. It was not filed by our group or by any members in our group, um, but uh, there is a, a lawsuit over last year's ethanol grant pending against the trust board. And so on advice of their legal counsel, which is the attorney general's office, uh, the trust board members are not talking to anybody, including us. Um, and so we'll continue to try, but as of right now, they're not, they're not speaking to us. Um, the one, one thing we've seen uh, since we've, we've formed and have started going to meetings and putting out press releases and so forth is uh, certainly lip service to 
uh, uh, following the statutes and using the scoring mechanism that uh, Dave mentioned uh, during their grant review process, that sort of thing. Uh, and I'll mention here that this is a place where I'm going to part company with uh, a, a number of my colleagues in the friends group. Uh, and several of us uh, dialed in, uh, zoomed in on the last two grants committee meetings. They only had three. Uh, and we, we were, I was in for the last two. And while I did hear lip service to follow the statutes and so forth, um, I also saw finagling of scores by the board or by the grant committee members who, by the way, are mostly new board members, but finagling of scores so that they could pull up a lower ranked grant and get it funded because an agency director wanted it. Uh, I saw budget cuts kind of willy nilly um, but, you know, they needed a little extra money over here. So they said, well, these guys are getting a lot of money. Let's just take some out of there without really looking carefully at what would be the impact on that proposal if you take away X number of dollars. Um, they weren't closely looking at the budget and the budget explanations and the proposed projects to say, you know, that project's not viable if we take away this money. Um, I saw, uh, I heard almost no conversation about the environmental benefits of various projects. Um, a, a surprising lack, well, maybe not surprising in light of what we know about the board, but uh, a lack of even basic uh, understanding of environmental, uh, how the environment works. Uh, and one example of that is a project that would uh, provide some work on a stream. I think maybe some stream bank stabilization um, would take place on a private landowner's property and the board, a couple of board members said, well, why would we fund that to benefit a private landowner? They should do it themselves. Well, this demonstrates to me a lack of understanding of downstream effects and, and possibly even upstream effects, depending on what the project is. Um, I just didn't hear any commitment to environmental values and very little knowledge. Um, and also just very little time spent really understanding these grants. And if you talk to the former board members, they talk, uh, and I <laughs> I know from, just because I know some of these people, how hard those grants committees used to work, uh, going through every grant and discussing every grant and determining whether it was something that needed funding. And that, that seems to have uh, been significantly reduced um, with these consequences. So as I said, um, I'm not sure my fellow uh, friends members agree with me completely on that. Uh, but there's there's certainly a ways to go in terms of really funding good conservation projects. Uh, having said that, a couple of things that I think are <laughs> this so far have a couple of bad things that haven't happened yet. I'll put it that way. Um, if you were uh, one of the people who zoomed in to the June board meeting when they gave final approval approval to the ethanol grant and defunded Dave's grant and some other valuable grants. Um, then you heard a discussion where board members said, look, we're not going to fund any conservation easements. We should just put that explicitly in the grant guidelines. And so they talked about that and ended up, so far they have not done that. Um, but uh, I, I, I doubt that's gone away as an issue. There, at least some of the board members are sensitive about that and will say, well, we don't have a policy that doesn't fund conservation easements. Um, but they don't fund conservation easements. So we'll see. We're watching that. The second thing that so far hasn't happened, uh, the Nebraska Department of Environment and Energy put in four grant applications totaling about $3.7 million for this current grant cycle. Uh, certainly three of them and arguably four of them are asking for money to fund uh, regulatory or mandatory projects uh, which should be, which is forbidden by state statute and really should be funded as an ongoing budget item by, you know, the state government responsibility. Um, that those, that they should not have been even submitted uh, because they violate state statute. They should have been declared ineligible by the board and not be in the grant pool. Uh, however, they are in the grant pool. The good news uh, is that they did not rank high enough for whatever reason uh, to qualify for funding, at least so far. The 
grant committee has conveyed their recommendations to the full board just recently. You can see them on the Environmental Trust website if you want to see what's proposed for funding for the coming year. Um, so what we're watching for in February is whether the board reruns last year's game plan where they uh, pluck up a lower scoring grant and fund it at the expense of a higher scoring grant as they did last year with the ethanol grant. So we're watching for that. Hopefully that won't happen. Uh, it's bad enough on the facts that I've just described to you, um, but it's the precedent that is really alarming to me. If the board uh, allows funding for what should be a regular state budget item, then, and, and, and that's acceptable, then what we possibly are open to is NET funding could just be soaked up by state agencies and there won't be money for the kinds of things that Dave has described and that have been funded over the years, including for Wachiska. They could easily soak up every penny, you know, very quickly. Uh, so that's that's the risk. Um, so we'll see. Hopefully we do not get to that point, but it's something to watch for. Uh, honestly, uh, <laughs> well, well, we'd like to think we've had some impact. Uh, I'd have to say the biggest thing that's probably given the board pause is the fact that uh, uh, W. Don Nelson and John Oberg filed a lawsuit against the trust board over the ethanol grants uh, last fall. And they have talked about this at multiple meetings. Uh, clearly it is on their minds. And so probably that's where, where credit needs to go for now. Uh, I uh, understand that as of now, uh, none of the funds to the for the ethanol blender pumps have been distributed. So, so that's a, a bit of good news. But it's uh, worth watching uh, that. So, two things that we have coming up: we are paying very close attention to board appointments. Um, and just to explain briefly how it works, board terms are six years. Board members are appointed by congressional district. The citizen board members are appointed by congressional district. Uh, their terms usually expire in March. The governor appoints uh, those individuals and they are done when there is an opening. So uh, someone can, if there's an opening, the board, the governor can appoint somebody and they begin service immediately without being confirmed by the legislature, uh, which is a little odd in, in my mind. Uh, there are three individuals uh, that are up um, uh, in March, and they have all been reappointed by the governor. They are uh, Jim Helbush, uh, Mark Quandall, who is actually filling out uh, a term. He was appointed last summer to fill out a term for Bob, Bob Crone, who resigned, uh, but then he's up for reappointment and has been reappointed. And then Rod Kristen, which is a name you'll recognize as somebody who uh, rents for grazing purposes, I believe, which is a property that you either own or you have conservation easements on. Um, I know you talked about him when you had your meeting talking uh, during the meeting, I don't know, August, September, where you talked about the Wachiska properties. Um, and so he's asked to be reappointed. Um, and in... Uh, the, the state statute that talks about the board members says that the citizen members shall represent the general public and shall have demonstrated competence, experience, and interest in the environment. Um, so we are not sure that we're seeing that. We are going to be prepared come the, um, uh, oh, I, I'm sorry. I think I, I didn't finish uh, describing the process. Governor appoints people. Um, and then the next time the legislature is in session, the Natural Resources Committee has a hearing on the appointments um, and they and then the full legislature confirms the individuals. So we're expecting a hearing of the Natural Resources Committee in February or March probably of this year. Uh, and we plan to be there and have comments about these appointments. Um, uh, in, in very late breaking news, I can tell you that a board member named Sherry Benton has resigned and the governor immediately appointed uh, a fellow named uh, Josh Anderson from the Rainwater Basin to uh, take Ms. Vinton's place. Um, now, there are several things about this uh, that are a, a concern of ours. The 
trust board um, by any standard definition of diversity is an epic failure. There uh, will now be, uh, with uh, uh, Sherry Benton's resignation, of the 14 members on the board, five are state agency directors. They are all, all middle-aged to older white men. And of the nine citizen board members, all now will be white men. Um, when the board, uh, and I, I think maybe the youngest one is mid thirties, uh, but mostly middle, older um, crowd. Um, when the board was first created in the early nineties, there were three women, three women. Uh, at its peak, there were six women, and under the Ricketts administration, the number of women has declined, and now we will have none. Uh, equally disturbing to me, considering what this organization funds, is um, all these board members, the farthest west board member will be from Edgar, which is about 35 miles southeast of Hastings. So think about that. Every single member of this board will be from the eastern third of the state. There will be no representation from the western two thirds, including that gorgeous Pine Ridge area, which arguably should have some representation. To the best of my knowledge, there have never been any individuals of color on the board. And to the best of my knowledge, never anybody say in their 20s who cares about these issues. Uh, so um, by any standard definition, of diversity, this board is a failure. It certainly doesn't represent Nebraska. Um, so we, we will be watching these appointments and, and doing what we can. The second thing we're paying attention to is monitoring legislation. Uh, so far, uh, what we were worried about was something like uh, a statute banning conservation easements. Uh, I mean, we can think of all kinds of nefarious things. So far, we are not seeing that. Uh, personally, I'm a little less concerned about that than I was in the fall. Uh, we know that state senators have been asked because of the pandemic not to put in any more bills than they have to because they're just, it, it's slowing them up a lot with the pandemic and who knows, they could end up adjourning again or whatever. Um, and then of course they've got you know, all these issues they need to deal with that are a uh, big mess. So I'm I'm a little less concerned than I was about legislation. I understand the board's not interested. We don't want it. I I so I'll be surprised, but we'll see. We're we're watching. So uh, that's what we've got coming up. The um, how, how can how can Wachiska members? How can we help? Um, but first, by continuing to do um, you know what what you've been doing for all along, which is paying attention to legislation and uh, taking putting out the action alerts, taking action when needed. Call or drop a note to the governor you know, or your state senator um, or you know the trust board members. Uh, they, they are appointed by congressional districts. So in addition to the statute, which says they represent the general public, it seems to me if you're appointed by congressional statute or, or congressional district, then you, you also represent in particular the people in that congressional district. And I don't know why it had never occurred to me until just a, a few days ago, we should all be dropping a line to whoever it is that's appointed to represent our congressional district or, you know, the whole crowd. They, they, they are supposed to be representing us. And there's, I, I bet they don't hear from a lot of people who just say, you know, I, I want those conservation values protected. I, I want good, I want, you know, beautiful places preserved for the future. And we can, we can do that and we probably should. Um, I, I'll encourage you to uh, attend a meeting, uh, maybe, maybe post pandemic, uh, but attend a, a trust board meeting or a grants committee meeting. They are, personally, I think they're kind of interesting. And as I said, it makes a difference uh, for them to know that people do care about what they do and are paying attention. So think about doing that. Uh, uh, unfortunately, it's, it appears they're going back to in-person only meetings, at least for now. Um, but that that can change depending on what the pandemic situation is. So um, put that on your to do list. Uh, and uh, just to to uh, uh, hate to deal in rumors, but uh, picked up a little bit of a rumor that the board is maybe going to be reducing the amount of public uh, comment it's willing to take at their meetings, uh, which is a concern in itself. 
um, and something that we should be pushing back on. So, but they still are going to be taking public comment. They're going to have to take some. So we can we can do that. Uh, you might also consider the other opportunities for advocacy that we all have, you know, a letter to the editor, post on social media if you're into that. Uh, I never listen to the governor's uh, radio show, but I understand you can call in and chat about issues if you want to, uh, you know, other organizations that we all belong to. So take advantage of those opportunities um, to, to call attention to the to the trust. And finally, I'll say that although we are not a uh, membership organization, um, I do have, uh, we've got a list of uh, names and email addresses that we've collected from people who said, um, I'd like to, um, you know, I'd like to know what your group's up to, or I'd like to join, but there's nothing to join. Um, and I also collected uh, names and email addresses from people who provided testimony to the board in June. Uh, and we've used that that email list a few times to let people know, uh, you know, give people a heads up on something. We'll use it, for example, when the um, uh, Natural Resources Committee hears uh, the, the board appointments in February, February or March. So if you're interested in being uh, on that list, uh, we'd be happy to have you. I would recommend you Google our name. You'll find our website. Um, and there's a contact us page. You can put in some information and, and I'll add you to the list. And if you want off, you can let me know and I'll take you off. And I'll mention while you're on our uh, website, you might take a look and see uh, we've got a, a, a really nice uh, primer on conservation easements that if you're looking for a little more information or want to refer somebody, it's a, it's a nice Q&A on, on conservation easements. The other website I'll recommend to you is the Environmental Trust website. There is loads of information there in terms of uh, the pending grants and stuff that's been funded and their annual reports and so forth. Just, just really a lot of great information. So that's what I've got. So thank you very much. Thank you both. That was, that was very interesting. Uh, I'll open it up. Uh, questions from the floor. Yeah, this is Glenn Pollock. I understand that uh, the Natural Resources uh, Committee has to approve and then it goes to the state legislature. So I understand the state uh, unicameral has never, never turned down anybody uh, with a letter to our, our uh, senator saying this person uh, might be a decent human being, but they're not qualified to be on the board. And the next thing is, if we get a new governor that's that's environmentally conscious, can he ask that board to resign and appoint his own people? Hmm. Um, you know, I've wondered myself if, uh, if a governor can ask for resignations. And so I, I guess I don't know. I think it's probably unlikely, but if somebody else knows, they can speak up. Um, in terms of uh, commenting on board members, um, at least when I've been at hearings where you know, similar types of appointments have come up, there's almost never a challenge to that individual and, and almost no questions in terms of their, whether they're actually qualified to do what it is they're supposed to do. And so um, I, I'm, I'm not wildly optimistic that will slow them down, but I think Glenn, it's kind of uh, like I said before that, you know, we've got to, we still have to keep at it. And um, if we keep insisting that we need a board that's qualified and cares about these issues, um, and you know, at some point, politicians do respond to what constituents want, and we keep saying it enough. Um, hopefully, we'll we'll get it. Um, but I'll, I'll I'll bow to somebody else who maybe has better answers. Lori, this is Don Nelson. Hmm. Having served as chief of staff to three different Nebraska governors. I've been down to this rodeo many times. Lynn's question has three answers. First of all, it depends on the statutory language of the particular appointee. Some positions serve at the pleasure of the governor. If you hold one of those positions, the governor can come to work tomorrow morning and say, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Other positions 
do not serve at the pleasure of the governor, but serve for a term certain. And so even if the governor asks for resignation, the person can decline the request. Some of you may remember the kerfluffle 15 or 20 years ago, where one of the governors wanted one or two members of the board of par parole to step down and one of the appointees declined to step down. The governor tried legal means to remove her and the court ruled in her favor. Now, there are lots of ways a governor can get an appointee to spend time in their life pursuing another venture. So having been there myself, Glenn, my reaction is if a governor wants someone gone, they should be able to accomplish it one way or another. And if they don't get the job done, maybe they don't understand the word governor. John, I presume you're, you're talking in general, right? Throughout state government and not specifically the NET board? Well, each board has an enabling statute. Right. And it sets forth the profile of the board members, the number of board members, whether the appointment requires partisan balance or not. There are a whole, almost a smorgasbord of characteristics that the state legislator creating a board can pick and choose from. So mm -hmm. there's a whole array of different structures for boards. Right, yeah. I mean, one a kind of a follow-up question that I have to that is, are there any state, well, no, there's not because of term limits. I mean, you know, to me, it seems like there's no rumbling at the state house by legislators. And is that because those who are legisl legislators today don't understand really what NET is about and what its statutory authority is and, and what it should be doing? Um, or is, I mean, it, I don't quite understand why the downtown there's not much, not much um, coming out of there. I think you're right, Teresa. I think the legislators underappreciate the environmental trust. Uh, like many Nebraskans, I don't know that they're all that well informed on what the environmental trust does. Uh, those that do understand what the Environmental Trust does may be upset because they don't agree with some of the things that they find. You know, some people have thought maybe we should go to the legislature and try and set the trust straight that way, but that's fraught with all kinds of potential pitfalls, mainly that you could easily amend something that we like into something we don't oh, like. Oh, uh, yeah. And so that's, that, that's a very real threat in the Nebraska legislature. That's true, especially in this day and age. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, and, and to echo what Dave says, I think, you know, there are there are senators who care about this. Um, I went through all the um, testimony submitted uh, last June uh, regarding the ethanol grant. And there were, as I recall, I mean, that was, that was June, right? But there were, as I recall, several state senators who'd included letters about it saying, this is wrong. You know, we shouldn't be doing this. But I, I just think they're so overwhelmed. There's just so many issues. Uh, I, was on, I was on a call, a, a different group meeting. Um, there were half a dozen Lincoln area senators on there. And um, I made sure I was first in line to ask a question during the Q&A. And I said, do, do any of you anticipate any legislation on the environmental trust? And it, it was kind of a, huh, environmental trust, you know? And there was, there was nobody had that as a priority. Uh, the, the closest we got was Adam Moorfeld saying, 
Well, there was some, I'd be, you know, I'd be paying close attention, but I, I just think they're just overwhelmed. So we'll see. But we do know there are senators who care about, who care about this, um, but maybe not enough to, to get it done. You know, I, I, uh, to, a question that I see um, in the in the chat is about pressuring the board to do remote meetings. Um, my understanding is that's that's dictated by the governor. So um, I think if you want to pressure somebody about having Zoom as an option, it's it's got to be the governor rather than the. Well, we can express that desire, I guess, but um, it's really the governor's call. Lori? Yes. Uh, this is Arliss. Uh, somebody asked the question, did this issue of board members who don't seem to know much about conservation begin with the present administration? Uh, you know, as far as I know, I don't know, what's your, what's your thought on that, Dave? You know, when I think about the people who were appointed before, they at least cared about it, even if they weren't environmental experts, but... Yeah, I agree. You know, people like Jerry Lawrenson were uh, appointed by the former governor, and Jerry has a keen interest in conservation, as does Gail Yanni and some of those people. So I, I do think it is particular to this administration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these these seem to be uh, much more purely political, politically aligned appointments than um, in, interest in the in the trust. So what what we've heard is your ideological stance on conservation easements is much more important than any experience in conservation. And so, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the other thing I'll mention is I see uh, uh, at least one person who's asked to be on our email list. Um, if if you'll go through our website, that'd be really helpful because I'm not. I guess I'm not entirely sure uh, who I, who I'm seeing. So. Because um, I need obviously a name and an email. Uh, Could I ask a question? This is uh, Tim. Not. Um, what about the uh, possibility of a ballot initiative to correct some of the flaws in the original legislation? And number two, uh, if you, I've looked at uh, the potential for lawsuits by the Friends of Environmental Trust. Uh, is that practical? Is it a very expensive or un unreasonably expensive proposition to do a, a lawsuit of a, a certain type? Thirty to fifty thousand dollars if it's not appealed, or a ballot initiative. A ballot initiative runs anywhere from seventy-five thousand to one hundred twenty-five thousand. Yeah, well, and our group literally has not one thin dime. We, we've got a member who fortunately has got a, uh, a Zoom account. So we, we rely on her personal Zoom account. So we, we aren't filing any lawsuits. You know, the other thing is there is, there is one lawsuit, you know, already filed. And yeah. uh, thank goodness. So that's, you know, we'll, we'll rely on that. In terms of a ballot initiative, um, you know, one, one of our concerns is that the legislature gets involved that we draw too much attention to this because we're really concerned about what could happen um you know when the legislature gets in the middle of the of the trust it doesn't end well for the trust you, you'll recall that at one point um you know we had uh you know we had half the net proceeds minus the little bit for you know gambling uh programs um and then the state fair got uh, 10%. And so the trust got less. Uh, so we're, we're not terribly eager to reopen any legislation because it, it, it may not end well for us. And I, I, I would through the same thing with a ballot initiative that it, uh, even if we could afford it, that it could maybe have some consequence we wouldn't like. Three things can happen. Dave, can you? Two of them are bad. Dave, can you uh, explain quickly the tax uh, situation with easement lands, is it a positive or a negative uh, as far as legislatures and uh, the trust is concerned? Uh, of our uh, 40 odd conservation easements, we're not aware of one that has reduced property tax. Uh, we're aware of one person 
who tried because his land actually went up in value. It got classified as recreational land instead of farmland. Uh, he tried to use the easement to convince the county to lower it back down, and he failed. Uh, there are people, the opponents will try to convince you property taxes are a big issue, but they have absolutely no information to back it up, kind of like voter fraud. You say it often enough, long enough, people start to believe it, uh, but there's no information to back that up. Uh, another thing we're hearing recently is, oh my gosh, if our county gets plastered with conservation easements, I'll start selling at lower property values and they'll impact property values across the county and hence impact property taxes. That too is a somewhat uh, ridiculous statement because I think 0.037% of the land in Nebraska has conservation easements on it. It's a vanishingly small amount uh, and it's, it, it's not going to be enough to affect property taxes. And if easements ever do affect property taxes, then we should have a conversation about that. If there's actual information that says they are, that's not our intent. We don't want to you know, harm property tax bases, and we should have a conversation about that. But we certainly aren't there yet. Chad, Grand Chats would probably increase the property tax a lot more. You know, there, there is that argument, but then there's also the counter argument to that, that when you get uh, 150 people living where there used to be four, you've greatly increased the county services that need to be provided to those people. Fire, police, ambulance, schools, all of that stuff. And so, there is what it's called a cost of community services argument that always needs to be weighed against any potential increase in tax bills. I had a um, comment. I did. It seems to me the greatest danger is that all of the pressure to uh, hold taxes down will mean that the absorption of the environmental trust money into agency budgets is uh, a serious threat, which seems to me to undermine any idea of an environmental trust. I mean, it doesn't even take the details of it. It, it takes the broad intent of what people voted for. So it, I, I'm not sure what my conclusion is, except that I think that needs to be stated often that this money was held to be special and has a certain function outside of state agencies. Um, I guess that's it. I think that's right on target, Marilyn. Uh, somewhere there's some very lovely language, I believe that was spoken by Randy Wood, who is a former director of DEQ, that the trust was intended to make possible citizen initiatives in conservation. Oh, it, wasn't in, it wasn't intended to make possible uh, budget reductions for state agencies. Uh, and so you're absolutely right. Uh, it is a perversion of the trust to start using those funds for to fund agency activity. And, and yeah, you know, I, I oh, if I could just add to that, I yeah, I, I, I absolutely I agree with that. Um, and that's why we're so concerned about these NDEE grants. Um, this is a first uh, where a state agency uh, would just, you know, that money just basically would go into their, their yearly budget. Um, I, I meant to mention this, that uh, over the years, Damon Parks is one of the largest, if not, well, maybe is even the largest uh, grantee of trust fund grants. I don't, uh, I'm not sure exactly who ranks highest, but they're up there. However, my understanding of Gaiman Parks grants is they have been more like project specific as opposed to funding an ongoing responsibility of their state agency. And oftentimes those funds have been uh, pass through to uh, conservation organizations or to individual landowners who've made, you know, improvements as part of a bigger project, you know, a conservation project, something like that. Um, so those those game and parks grants um, are are not at all the concern that these NDEE grants um, would be if they were funded. And so that's why we've really pushed back hard on those grants. And if they are funded, that is an enormous concern going forward, you know, what, what that could mean. Right. I'm sorry, I, Teresa. It almost, oh, that's Go okay. Ahead. I was just going to kind of, in hearing the discussion, and this has been great tonight because it's helped pull together a lot of little snippets and conversations and articles and everything that have been out there. And it, it seems 
to me, like the bottom line is we almost need some type of, we need to be doing a grassroots effort by each of us, uh, you know, to have, to mention this to the things, you know, like Randy Woods quote, you know, if we all had little something like that, those little one liners or something that we could uh, use when we're talking to our uh, neighbors, we're talking to our families, you know, we're talking to landowners uh, near our prairies that Wachiska owns or just in general, so that we as individuals, if we start talking about that and people start asking more questions, there may be some interest in percolating from the bottom up rather than trying to come in from the side angle with the legislature or the board directly and trying to get them to change their attitudes, which we know isn't gonna happen. But if the general public starts understanding, here's what the legislation said, do you know, do you know how it's being used? Do you know where your, your conservation dollars, your lottery dollars are being spent these days? So I think that would be, you know, if there, I guess if there's a, a request from you two is if there are some one-liners or little statements like that, that we as citizens could utilize, not as Wachiska members, because that's the fine line we have to walk is because Wachiska does apply for and does have grants from NET. So we've encouraged our members, you know, any conversations that they're having, make it known that they're talking as an individual and not as an uh, as Wachiska. So that's one caution that that we have, whether, you know, it's intended or not, you know, whether it would get us in trouble or not, but we're kind of trying to be over protective of Wachiska from that perspective. But it seems to me like that's one way that we as citizens can help. Yeah, and I, I just might add that, you know, we're gonna have to play the long game just as uh, our opponents have. Uh, this erosion didn't happen overnight. It happened board member by board member as the governor replaced uh, fair-minded board members with ideologically minded board members. And so I think it's gonna be extremely important whoever the next governor is that people, there is a grassroots effort to make him or her aware of the environmental trust, the good that it does, and that it needs to fund a wide array of projects, including land conservation. And then hopefully board member by board member, we can get the trust back on track in the future. Right. Um, I, this is Tim Not again, I got a kind of a, uh, an unimaginative idea, but is it possible that uh, the friends of the trust could put out a pamphlet with some of their best arguments and phrases and so forth that the rest of us could distribute um, to help inform the public? You know, um, I think that's a really good idea, Tim. That, and I've already made a note that we should we should put together something like that for our website. Mm -hmm. um, one, one of the things we've talked about is, uh, and, and it's already there on conservation easements. So you will be prepared. You, you can just dazzle people with your knowledge of conservation easements after reading what we've got on our website. But And that is uh, a good paper, Lori. That is a good paper. I know some people who use that during the public hearings last, uh, last year. Oh, good, good. Well, uh, it, it, it uh, Thanks goes to a number of people who uh, we, we, we are grateful for their uh, in, quiet input into that effort. But um, we should add some more to the website in terms of things like that Randy Wood quote and mm -hmm. uh, a few things like that. I will say that, uh, you know, one of the best arguments for the trust and one of the reasons it's so beloved by so many people is they really have done a wonderful job of spreading money around the state. Every county has gotten funding. It's funded small projects, little tiny projects, and you know, obviously very expensive ones. Uh, so there, it's it's it really has been um, a wonderful thing for the statewide. Uh, and there aren't a lot of things like that. Um, and my understanding is it's very unique nationally to oh, have yeah. a source of funds like this. And um, yet, yet another reason why we really need to protect it. But I've made a note and we'll see if we can get some things, um, you know, added that that might be useful to to pluck out and use as needed. So thank you for the suggestion. Yeah, thank, thank you for taking that task. <laughs> Anything in the chat box? Anything else, Arliss? 
My mic is not working. The, the only thing uh, I see is the, uh, somebody wanted the website for the friends and Ray put that up there. Did everybody see that? You could read it, but it's kind of long. Can yeah. I uh, quick comment about the disaster in Iowa? that uh, when the lottery became legal, the funds all now in Iowa go to the general fund. And it was supposed to go then to a thing called Resource Enhancement and Protection REAP. And there was a certain amount of money they were supposed to give every year and it's never been fully funded. And it only goes to government agencies, local and state government agencies. So their lottery money, the vast majority of it goes to the general fund. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I have a kind of a peculiar thing to mention here, but I believe the rule for the Lincoln City Council or the county board is that um, it's not uh, legal to have private meetings to decide issues uh, before the general council meeting. Um, let's say two or three of the city council or the county board people I believe are not allowed to get together over a coffee and decide how they're going to vote on things. They have to make these decisions as part of the regular meeting. And um, is there anything that could be done regarding that uh, kind of thing that I believe is taking place in the governor's office? <laughs> um, you know, I don't know uh, if. Uh, yeah, I see Debbie Don is still here. As I recall, and Don, I don't know if you want to talk about your lawsuit. There is a request in the chat that you give a quick update on the status of that. But as I recall, open meetings violation is maybe open meetings act violation, which is what Tim is talking about. Is um, was that one of your complaint uh, items? Yes. Mm. Good. Yeah, the, the fact that they could have no discussion about and, and just do some of these things, Tim, in an open meeting certainly would cause one to be suspicious that there'd been discussion that violated the Open Meetings Act. So we'll see, I guess, but. I can tell you when they denied our extension without discussion on a unanimous vote, uh, that didn't look like uh, there was much deliberation going on. <laughs> Oh, can you say anything more, Don, about the status of the, the lawsuit? I think what, not. what the latest actions have been? Are you deliberately trying to extend this meeting till 9 p.m.? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just trying to respond to so the question that someone put in the chat box. But if, if it's uh, if it would take a couple of hours, we'll 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 pass for now. Well, we'll read it in the paper I can summarize by saying that until the defendant files their response to our lawsuit on Monday, mm -hmm. we have no idea how we're gonna adjust our lawsuit and fine tune the pleadings. Okay, so Monday is their deadline to file their response. Oh, here we go, we're about ready to go plunge into nine o'clock. The original <laughs> lawsuit was against one defendant, the Environmental Trust. Mm -hmm. But then once we discovered some of the evidence around the ethanol grants, we amended to include as defendants, the Department of Energy and Environment plus the private corporation Green Plains. So that expanded the lawsuit to cover three defendants. And the last, the clock to resp respond for the last two defendants gets another 30 day clock. So okay. their answer to the lawsuit won't come until first week in February. Okay, gotcha. All right, thank you, thank you. Okay, anything else? You know, somebody asked about um, 
board members who own or have an interest in land. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a small state in a lot of ways. Um, and if you, so the fact that you met, I mean, you can't always anticipate a conflict when you get appointed, but if you do have a conflict of interest, uh, you should be declaring that, you should be abstaining from a vote. Um, depending on what the situation is, you maybe need to file uh, with the Accountability and Disclosure Commission. Um, and uh, in fact, that's some of the digging around that the friends are doing uh, in preparation for the appointment hearings is we have some concerns about um, whether people have uh, made the disclosures that they are obliged to or abstained when they should have, that sort of thing. So um, it's a good question. Um, as I said, sometimes you don't know, you know, in advance what conflicts may come up. I know on this, uh, for the current grant committee, uh, at the last meeting, um, there was a, some project that they voted on that one of the members owns a piece of property adjoining it. So he abstained from voting, um, which he probably didn't need to do, but, you know, he did. Um, so, it, I, you know, different people handle it differently, but you absolutely should be disclosing a conflict. It's just all we're asking for, all we are asking for is basic good governance here. Um, and that's basic good governance. Mm -hmm. Yep, good points. Okay, going once, we, we've kept uh, Dave and Lori on for over an hour here, grilling them, so fine presentations. Thank you both very much. This was excellent, excellent. And uh, yeah, we can tell from the, the large number of people who, who logged on that this is a topic of concern for a lot of individuals. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, one last time, going once, going twice. Three times, okay. Thank you very much. Everyone have a safe evening and don't get blown away or caught in a blizzard. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Thank yeah, you. thank you very much. Thank You're you. Welcome. Welcome. Great info, Bye. thank you. Take care. Oh, my mic. Hello, Mikey.